So this underground art, the cultural <coughs> politics of mass transit uh, project is really part of a larger research endeavor that looks at the confluence of cultural policy and transit planning through a focus on art and design of urban rail systems in three cities, in Toronto, in New York, and in London. And I'm gonna talk primarily about Toronto today, uh, but I'd be happy to elaborate further on some of the other cities um, in a bit of discussion. So this is now common sense for everyone in the room, I'm sure, but uh, I'll start with a little bit of background. So it's now well accepted that uh, the Toronto's transit system is in crisis. So the challenges are numerous, but there is a widespread frustration at the chronic lack of adequate and secure funding, at the poor quality of transit operations, and persistent stalling on the construction of new projects. And these have resulted in expensive and rising ridership costs, a high fare box ratio that puts the financial burden of transit operations on users, an outdated network that's rife with transit deserts, uh, particularly in the inner suburbs, inaccessible stations and vehicles for those with reduced mobility, there's chronic congestion and frequent service delays and the list goes on and on and on. Um, so in this context, it's somewhat surprising uh, that the TCC and Metrolinx are investing heavily in art and design, uh, sponsoring iconic station architecture from the likes of Norman Foster and Will Althorpe, who hosted stations on the news for that extension, um, and also allocating 0.5% of any capital budgets for station artwork and special finishes, 0% for art program. So today, arts are integral to the network brand and imageability, even while large-scale systemic transformations remain elusive. Not only are art, design, and architecture, which I'm kind of bundling together under the, the name Transit Arts, um, not only are these a touchstone of the most recent subway and LRT extensions, so both the Shepherd Line, the Spadina extension, and the Crosstown LRT feature art and design quite prominently, but the TTC has also invested in uh, multiple ways with the city, or sorry, has involved itself in multiple ways with the city's creative industries. So it's partnered with arts events like Nuit Blanche, uh, the Contact Photography Festival, and the Toronto Urban Film Festival. Um, and it's aligned itself with municipal policies which aim to reinvent Toronto as a global cultural capital. So I'm interested in this tension. So on the one hand, public transit system is suffering from defunding and the degrading of public services that's a result of, kind of continued rounds of austerity. And on the other hand, there's a renewed celebration um, of the civic potential of public transit and a channeling of investment into cultural aspects of infrastructure. And so my overall aims in the, the broader project are really fourfold. Um, so first, to analyze how and why art design and architecture have become integral and priority elements of transit investments, to investigate the diverse meanings that are articulated by transit art, to critically assess how transit art is implicated in the political economy of urban and regional development and in the larger project that we've done comparatively, um, and then lastly, to develop better theoretical tools for understanding the symbolic power of transit today um, and the symbolic power of infrastructure. And I'm going to begin the discussion and really just open up to a series of questions that are undergirding this analysis through focusing on four specific artworks in Toronto. So the first bit that I want to think about today is the piece Zones of Immersion, which is by Toronto artist Stuart Reed, which is installed in 2015 at Union Station. Consisting of 170 meters of floor to ceiling panels of silver stained enamel, engraved and laminated glass that are embedded along the central divide of uh, the two TTC subway platforms, the installation offers a candid portrait of urban travel. The panels display approximately 60 enlarged images based on real time observational sketches of people riding the subway, as well as short poems inspired by commuting. The figures depicted their familiar countenances of the underground. They have despondent and melancholic expressions, testaments to the tedium and isolation of everyday life. Their bodily gestures, hunched backs, folded arms, uh, similarly express the weary comportments of travel under conditions of neoliberalism. So every few meters, magnified anonymous faces with sunken eyes gaze daringly out at their real world counterparts such that the observer can't help but being drawn into the image and its dynamic composition. 
forming a long translucent screen, the panels force commuters to see themselves mirrored in the scenes that are represented. In this sense, the installation captures the elegant rhythms and encounters of urban transit while reflecting the transient and spectral crowd back onto itself. And the work defies a public expectation that art should be a whimsical and soothing distraction from the tedium of commuting. Instead, it depicts the subway as an alienating place and it forces riders to confront the often bleak reality of transit in the city. A Toronto Star article at the time of the installation's unveiling suggested that the work was, quote, depressing, creepy, and gloomy, and a reminder of the miserable fact of daily travel. And these accusations are all the more notable given that the artwork was positioned as the centerpiece of a campaign to improve the brand association and journey experience of the TTC and to modernize the rapid transit network. Um, so I'm interested in what this work does uh, at multiple scales and on multiple different fronts. So at a most immediate level, um, I, we might ask to what extent the installation critically engages uh, commuting publics. So does this inherently self-reflective piece affect an interrogation of the mobility experience and the urban forms in which it's embedded? Can it estrange the familiar experiences of commuting and in so doing disrupt status quo assumptions about movement throughout the city? Or does its viewing at a glance merely reproduce the spectacle of commuting while leaving its uncontested social content untouched? Oh, sorry, its contested social content untouched. Mm -hmm. um, insofar as it reveals the radical distance between the experience and the ideal of movement along North America's best transit system, the TTC Life 68, um, to what extent does it open up to radically different kinds of mobility futures? Or if the images, which are both documentary and speculative, spectral and spectacular, merely reveal what commuters already know, that commuting is often miserable, um, what political traction does it offer? And if we telescope out slightly, we might also ask about the relationship of the installation to the ongoing $640 million revitalization of Union Station, uh, which is Canada's biggest intermodal transportation hub. So the changes to the TTC platform are just one part of a wider endeavor to expand the capacity and the quality of movement throughout the station to beautify the site and its surroundings. So why is design, art, entertainment, and cultural programming, which is all tied together in the Union Station um, revitalization and founded, or sorry, funded through TD Bank, so why is this such an essential element of the station's uh, renewal? Do these high profile and high cost public works create more livable, joyous experience of movement for commuters throughout the city? Do they animate the space, which is the, the kind of buzzword that's used in all these agencies? What role does this installation and others, which are all linked through an overarching redesigned theme of globalism, flux, and movement, play in re-symbolizing the historic site as a modern mobility hub? And how do aesthetic improvements materially revalue the station space and the surrounding neighborhood in the political economy of placemaking? So just uh, a few weeks ago, BIG, so the Bjork Ingalls Group, it's a major architectural firm, um, announced their plans for large-scale futuristic new development around the station will feature 1.7 million square feet of office, data-centered space, and leisure event space. Um, and so that's tied to the renewal of, of the station itself and uh, kind of the brand of the, the transit hub. And then lastly, in terms of uh, Toronto's urban development writ large, we could reframe those, these questions and ask how the realty and rebranding emphasis of art is also achieved at the urban regional scale through recasting the entire transit network as a metonym for the good city. So given that art and design are at the forefront not only of the Union Station overhaul, but all the capital investments, um, what kind of metropolitan aesthetics and are, are being created for the network? And how does this tie into the global city aspirations of Toronto? Do they convince residents of Toronto as well as investors and tourists that the city's transit network is a state-of-the-art amenity that's fit for the world-class city it aspires to become? Or do arts investments here merely appear to be a bold new direction in an urban region that still lacks substantive ambition, action, and investment? 
So the second work I want to talk about is located at Pioneer Village Station, and perhaps this case is familiar to, to you already. Um, so this is the fourth stop on the new Toronto York Spadina subway extension, uh, situated at the northwest corner of York University and on the city boundaries between Toronto and, and Bonn. And lights fell here by uh, German studio Realities United of Tim and Jan Edler is built directly into the Pioneer Village Station. An integrated component of the station design, light spell suspended light features are intended as a quote, super sculpture, which performs both as station lighting and as an art installation. The interactive piece consists of an array of 62 light elements, which are suspended continuously from the ceiling through the, um, uh, through the two mezzanines, as well as the central train platform. Each element is made up of 16 controllable luminaries and produce all of the letters of the alphabet, as well as special characters and numerals. And riders can use one of five interfaces on the subway platform to type a message of up to eight characters that appears <coughs> in real time for everyone to see. Uh, the installation is described by the artist as an experiment in public interaction, transforming individual desires, the, the messages, into a collective service, lighting, uh, the station stages a democratic reflection on what they call, quote, the freedom of the individual versus the interests of the larger group. The openness of the system is meant to inspire users in creative ways, and, well, and the digital format is supposed to engage user-centered, tech-based media platforms. And yet, this is the end yet, uh, the $1.9 million installation has sat unused since its opening in December 2017. When the TTC decided not to activate light spell out of concerns that it could be used to display dangerous or offensive messages. <laughs> um, should have seen that one coming. Uh, TTC <laughs> spokespersons insist that it's imperative that the network remain welcoming for all, and that especially in the context of what they call the most diverse city in the world, it's crucial that the network does not provide a platform for hate speech. The studio, uh, Realities United, had a slightly different perspective. Um, and they interpreted this move as undue censorship and co even compared the TTC, TTC's actions to uh, North Korea, uh, kind of authoritarian rule of North Korea. So uh, the most obvious issue raised by the installation um, in relation to the critical function of art here concerns the extent to which transit networks are and can be public spaces for social engagement, discourse, and civic activism. To what extent, particularly in a context where authorities seemingly don't trust the public with tools of civility, uh, can transit art inspire democratic dialogue? In an era where transit construction, management, <coughs> operations are privatized and marketized, can the quality of transit interaction remain public? And how might sp the specific interactions of light spell then shed light on more general conflicts between individual and group interests that play out in transit planning more broadly? So uh, beyond the form, oh sorry, beyond its stated content, the form of light spell is also significant. So transit networks today are increasingly connected to the vast internet of things. They're finally woven into the fabric of smart cities. Um, and in this context, uh, the significance of digital, digital visual cultures and imaginaries of transit also comes to the fore. So digital forms are often explicitly preferred by culture-seeking transit agencies because corporate advertisers will pay for their upkeep. Across a number of different cities. And in Toronto, GTC's Arts for Commuters uh, is a program that's partnered with Patterson Media, which controls all of these television screens that you see on all of the Toronto GTC, <coughs> all the, the subway platforms. So, what are the ramifications of new media and technology in the public transit realm? How might transit agencies and public authorities best ensure that digital platforms are participatory and not passive, are collective and not marketized, and creative and not securitized? And then finally, uh, the light spell debate also exemplifies the troubling planning and procurement practices for cultural production and for infrastructure more generally. So the work was deactivated just days before Pioneer Village was set to open. Um, and the decision came as a surprise both to the TTC riders and to the artists who claimed that they had had extensive discussions with the transit agency dating back to 2009. So almost a decade of discussions and then two days before it was set to open, they all of a sudden realized that somebody might put a swear word on 
the screen or something. Um, and so beyond questions of freedom of speech, I think most people in Toronto were simply frustrated at yet another example of public funds being squandered on something that was never realized or that might never be used. So the light spell boondoggle is a potent reminder to Torontonians of a mass transit system that's plagued by poor planning, stalled decisions, wasteful politicking, and project overruns and delays. It also raised the question of whether agencies that are perennially strapped for cash and suffering from extreme service and maintenance deficiencies should be spending money on arts at all, um, or whether the collective luxury of good design is actually central to um, and a prerequisite for meaningful public goods. So the third site that I want to talk about is this mural, which is called Community Spirit, and it's located on the construction hoarding of the future Laird Station site of the Crosstown LRT. Led by artist Katia Wright, the mural was created in the spring of 2017 um, as a community benefit partnership between the, co co uh, the contractor, so Cross Lakes Transit Solutions, um, and Thorncliffe, the Thorncliffe Park Neighborhood Office and the PACT Project, uh, which is a, a nonprofit social enterprise that does hoarding murals across Canada. Um, and this is one of three such crosstown hoarding murals. The other ones that uh, are located at uh, Victoria Park in Edmonton and at the future Mount Dennis Transit Station. So unlike much transit art, which is conceived by a singular artist who's parachuted in from elsewhere, uh, community spirit is explicitly focused on the shared dynamics of local place. This site-specific and collaborative work was designed and completed with the participation of Thorncliffe Park youth, and the images are meant to be uh, re receptive and adaptive to the community, reflecting, this is the artist's words, insights that are shared by local young people about their neighborhood, including landmarks and memories. Um, and Probably this is familiar to you, but Thorncliffe Park, of course, is a very stigmatized neighborhood within Toronto. Um, it's a neighborhood that has both crumbling high rises but su and suffers from a lack of social services, unemployment, and whose child poverty rates are the highest in the city. Um, it's home to large numbers of new immigrants, uh, particularly those from South Asia. And yet, this, as the mural depicts, it's also a space of vibrancy and life. Um, so apartment towers and road barriers here invoke the modernist post-war built form. Trees, ravines, um, and nature uh, suggest abundant access to green space. Colorful rainbow faces reflect both the harmony and diversity within the population. And then a prominent new LRT train embodies the hope of a transit-connected future. And this is one of the areas of the city that also currently um, suffers from not having access to rapid transit. So while the final product uh, might appear underwhelming and inconspicuous, especially compared to the spectacular displays of the previously two, previous two examples, <laughs> this temporary installation has aims beyond its technical uh, qualities and its spectator impact. So favoring the process of arts production and not the final results, community spirit sought, in its own words, to enhance the capacity building and social capital of its Ideally, um, and again these are the words of the artist, participation in this project not only had educational value insofar as those involved learn new skills, but in positioning youth as equal co-creators of, of their shared world, the mural transforms their relationship to the neighborhood and to the future transit system. The idea behind the project is that through collective envisioning and enacting new social and spatial configurations, Participants develop their sense of community in place, and they build much needed social capital. Now, the degree to which these lofty aims uh, are met, however, is really difficult to assess. And community spirit raises many questions about what the community benefits of art really are. So when the main target of public transit art is the transformation of social relations, how are these changes to be evaluated? which community or communities are benefiting and how, and community is always used as this kind of unitary, obfuscating thing instead of um, you know, a complicated, multiple um, concept. Are there appreciable changes between participation in arts programs and increased capacities of residents to determine their own realities? 
can transit art be a catalyst for residents to repossess self, space, and community, which is, of course, especially important um, in a stigmatized neighborhood like Thorncliffe Park? Can art engage the community equitably? Can it serve as a tool to express the social, cultural, and economic needs of its residents? And can it give them meaningful ownership over the processes of urbanization from which they've historically been excluded? Can it be used to overcome, uh, in other words, the racist and classist legacy of legacies of top-down transport planning? And in order to understand these questions, it's of course also important to note that Laird Station is not actually in Thorncliffe Park. Um, so it's uh, closer to Leeside, so it's up at Edmonton, it's about five kilometers away from, from Thorncliffe Park where many of these youth live. So there is some disjunct there in terms of, um, kind of bringing the community into a site where they don't actually live. So the targeted use of participatory art in so-called priority neighborhoods also raises flags about the conflict between creative initiatives that are meant to promote positive neighborhood development through the arts and the fact that arts are also a well-established factor in processes of gentrification and displacement. Um, and this is especially true at the Mount Dennis site where um, we're just facing heavily heavy redevelopment pressures already. So how might transit art function as a contributor, but also an antidote to the conflicts that surround the restructuring of urban infrastructure? Through the cross-child construction, public transit art is used to here to bridge the interests of community and developers. It's a tool to manage local stakeholders and to alleviate the negative impacts of construction. The mural puts a human face here, quite literally a, a human face on an otherwise overwhelming mega project, but it's not clear that this is a positive thing or for whom. So who is, in, in, who is excluded or evicted from this creative process? Uh, and then lastly, uh, the geography of these community-based projects is also notable and interesting. So uh, all of the mural projects are, create, are located in Toronto's inner suburbs. Um, so you don't see the same kind of work on the Spadina extension or on the downtown uh, revitalization. So the future station at Laird, Mount Dennis, and Pharmacy are neither historic centers like Union Station or prospective anchors <coughs> for TOD development um, like Pioneer Villages. So how can cultural works engage these often forgotten spaces without reproducing a dichotomy of community versus fine art that frequently maps on to suburb and city? And actually across the three cases that I look at, you often see these kind of community benefits programs being put in targeted uh, in priority neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, whereas you see the kind of iconic uh, art and design in already established financial hubs or in downtown cores. So you see this um, real divide in terms of the unevenness of, of design. And then lastly, um, I want to talk about a, a very different kind of artistic work. So this is the annual Freedom Train Ride. Each year, on the evening of July 31st and into the morning of August 1st, uh, thousands of people gather at Toronto's Union Station and crowd onto a specially reserved subway car to celebrate Emancipation Day, which is the day that slavery was abolished in the British Empire. So now in its seventh year, the Underground Freedom Train Ride takes participants on a symbolic non-stop journey from Union to Shepherd West Station to commemorate the experience of escaping slaves who made the harrowing journey to Canada along the Underground Railroad. And they feature each year they pick somebody who plays the role of um, Harriet Tubman and who kind of leads and is the conductor on the Freedom Train. So this event was initially launched um, and continues to be organized by a number of community organizations. Um, a different book list, the African Canadian Heritage Association, uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, the Ontario Black History Society, and the African Journalist Collective in partnership with the Toronto it's open to all who wish to, in the words of organizer Ita Sadu, celebrate the power and potential of people of African descent. So prior to boarding the train and then along the ride, there's drumming, dancing, songs, speeches, poems, and spoken word, a collective performance that's meant to be a moving public tribute to liberation, emancipation, and anti-racism. The event engages in rituals of remembrance and reflection to educate about an under-recognized history, and it highlights the continuity of abolition struggles into the present. 
Recent Freedom Rides has been explicitly linked to contemporary social movements like Black Lives Matter, who in Toronto as and elsewhere advocate for the ability of black people to lead, move freely without constraint. So the annual performance of Black Liberation is frequently attended by Toronto's mayor and representatives of the TTC. However, the carnivalesque event uh, stands in stark contrast to the status quo operations of the transit network. Not only do black neighborhoods and communities of color in Toronto suffer from transit poverty, as a recent uh, report puts it, um, which is only set to be replicated in uh, the Ford's new vision for transit on the map today, um, but the Toronto Transit Commission has also been shown to actively target black youth in fair policing, thus acting as an apparatus of state surveillance and violence. And indeed, in, in 2017, uh, John Tory was posing for a photo op at the Freedom Ride, and he was called out by uh, activist Desmond Cole over his role in supporting these kind of racist uh, policies of the city, including carving. So unlike most transit art, which is static, right? It's stuck to walls of stations, um, and, it's, and which assumes a rather inert individual spectator, this art is engaged, it's active, it's dynamic, and it's collaborative. It raises the question of genre here, and of the distinctive possibilities of transit art for forms of mobile engagement. So how might transit art create an immersive experience of communities moving together? What subversive, potential, subversive potentials for public art might exist in a subway car, for example, that are inaccessible in fixed locations such as stations, let alone more traditional venues for public art, such as plazas, parks, or squares, which have a, a kind of static uh, nature to them. The Freedom Ride is also explicitly, uh, explicitly about the politics of free movement. It suggests that transit art might be a particularly effective vehicle for the pursuit of transport equity and mobility justice. Given the long history of activism, especially civil rights and anti-racist activism that's linked to transport, what role can art play in mediating and facilitating these forms of struggle? Uh, it's particularly notable, I think, that the Freedom Ride doesn't celebrate Toronto as the promised land, um, thus glossing over any racial conflicts that continue to exist in Canadian society um, as perhaps the highly curated diversity of community spirit does. Instead, it tries to draw out those conflicts and to really use the, the venue to highlight the fractures in the body politic that are continuing into the present. So Freedom Ride is uh, particularly interesting <coughs> also um, in that it emerges not from a percent for art program or from a formal procurement process of TTC's art wing, um, or from a community benefit agreement, but it actually emerges from a grassroots initiative uh, that's rooted in quite radical circles. So the TTC came on board as a partner, but its role is really limited to providing a venue. And it remains the community groups who organize, plan, manage, curate, and act in this event. So uh, beyond official cultural policies and space-making activities, I'm also interested then in alternative practices and of public art that are possible in transit spaces. So how might a people's transit art, so underground imaginaries of infrastructure and mobility, challenge the official visions and inspire a different kind of aesthetic politics of urbanism? So I'm interested in a kind of a range of creative practices here. Um, of course, graffiti is probably the most prominent one, uh, but also other uh, performances of dance and music, uh, photography, sketches that people do as they're arriving in transit, um, Instagram photos that people post, there's all sorts of kind of train spotters and transit enthusiasts who are creating these alternative cultures around transit and alternative visual cultures too. So, um, so the broad strokes idea then behind this project is that around the world we've seen a turn to arts and cultural programs and transportation infrastructure which coincides with a dramatic increase in the modernization, expansion, and creative efforts whereby urban rail systems are uh, revived and redeveloped. Where some mass transit systems have long featured monumental art and design, so the Moscow Metro or the Stockholm Metro, for example, um, since the 1990s, there has been uh, a move around the world for public authorities to invest more thoroughly in high profile and high cost arts initiatives and to integrate them directly into infrastructure. So you see this pairing of um, art design and architecture as being kind of one bundled thing, whereas previously they were separate. 
So following from what were initially, uh, sorry, what were yeah, initially guidelines for national infrastructure, almost all investments in urban mass transit in North America and in the UK uh, over the last two decades have been accompanied by costly and high profile initiatives of art, design, architecture, and cultural programming. Uh, the nature of art transit is also being transformed. So it's no longer limited to wayfinding or ornamental functions um, as historically it might have been. Um, and instead, art is now being fully integrated into the design of transit spaces. And it's seen to be a crucial element of the public realm. While transit art is proliferating and has become a standard element of planning, it's not clear why and how municipalities and transit authorities are prioritizing the arts or what function this cultural production plays in broader dynamics of urban development. So I consider the symbolic power of transit today in order to understand this, the inextricability of art and mobility infrastructure. And existing explanations seem to fall short of answering these inquiries. So there's two explanations that are, are quite prominent in the literature that partially account for the resurgence of transit art today. Um, so Elizabeth Strom, for example, is one of the very few people to talk about metro art in particular. She writes about metro art in the 1990s um, as uh, a way for municipal governments to address the defunding and deterioration of public services. So art here was a relatively cost-effective way to sanitize the image of a crumbling public asset and stood in for more systemic <coughs> upgrades. And this was uh, especially, you can think of the, the kind of prime example of the New York City subway here, which um, in the 1990s was very stigmatized. Nobody wanted to, drive, to ride it. It was associated with high crime. Um, and the MTA uh, announced a new art program essentially to, to beautify the space, um, to make it more attractive and more palatable to, to uh, commuters. And this theory is a compelling explanation of crisis era investments, especially in the US context. Um, but it does little to account for the high profile, elite, and iconic character of much transit art today. And indeed, the MTA now is, uh, I think, the biggest um, collector of public art in the US. So it has one of the biggest collections across the US. Alternatively, uh, there's a lot of critical writing on culture-led uh, urban development that treats public art as a tool of competitive urban branding and urban placemaking. Um, so folks like Rosalind Deutsch, uh, Nguyen Kwan, Tim Paul, Malcolm Miles, Patricia Phillips, there's lots of people that write in this vein, um, and who demonstrate how aesthetics can enhance the land value of particular sites, uh, they can mark the arrival of a metropolis to create a world-class status, and that art, and they see art as an essential feature of urban regeneration. Yet this, uh, this narrative does, doesn't yet explain the specificity of transit art. So what is it that, why, why transit today? Um, and it also, uh, I don't think, does very much to explain the way that art is used in ways that exceed, subvert, or challenge uh, an, an economistic logic. And I think the three cases, or the four cases that we looked at today um, really have two sides. Um, so I'm interested in how art and design are used to further marketize trajectories of culture-led regeneration, but also I want to explore the way that art can be a civic tool of collectivity, critique, and democracy. Um, and from actually the, the interviews that I've done so far, there really is this, um, this hope in the civic potential of, of art and the civic potential of transit in particular. Um, that's very sincere by those who are involved. <laughs> So in an era of um, hypermobility and disconnection, the project attempts to zoom in on the particularities of transit art as a contested means of making urban space and making urban subjects. It analyzes the interrelated cultural, political, and economic forces that shape transit art and are shaped by transit art in turn. And what I call the cultural politics of infrastructure considers not only conflicts over transit art's construction, but also the various modes of signification through which infrastructures carry social and cultural content and address and constitute subjects. So these narrative and aesthetic aspects of infrastructure reveal transit to be, a transit space in particular, to be a complex set of semiotic and ideological as well as engineering, administrative, and financial relations. And um, I thus, through this project, seek ways of seeing transit art for what it can tell us about how urban societies work and about their trajectories of transformation. 